You'd uh, be turning over to the sixth chapter, chapter of the book of Zechariah. We'll begin there. <clears throat> As pertains to the hayride this Saturday, of course, we have to watch the weather. Last I checked, there was a 90% chance of rain for Saturday, but most of it's in the morning. So what it may work out to be a, is a hayless hayride. So I can't have to, you know, I borrow hay from the neighbor and I can't afford to get it wet. But I did check the list over here and the people have signed up. We've already got uh, uh, so far a, a box of Oreo cookies and a can of cheese Whiz. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it may not, be, may not be anybody sign up anyway, so we'll see. We'll see, but uh, we'll make do with what we have. I think one uh, for one time we uh, went for a ride with a trailer and just put uh, lawn chairs in the trailer and it worked out great. <laughs> of course, I didn't care. I wasn't in the trailer anyway. So, <laughs> But anyway, uh, we'll start in Chapter 6 of uh, Zechariah. Before we do, though, let's have a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time we have to study Thy Word. And there's so much that we need to be thankful for that we could not begin to cover all the things that are ours as a result of our relationship with Thee. But we thank Thee for this Word, for the guidance it provides us, and may we ever be diligent students of it, that we may better understand Thy will for us and live it day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Zechariah, of the, of the uh, minor prophets, of course, Zechariah is the, is the longest minor prophet book. And it, it does have some uh, apocalyptic language in it. And it is, I would say, more... Uh, uh, messianic in scope than maybe some of the other minor prophets. But whenever you're dealing with uh, apocalyptic language or any anything that's alluding to the uh, messianic uh, age, it, it had to be given in a manner that was understandable by the people at the time. And we may not understand it always, but you know, we can understand what it's not, but may not always understand what it is, but but you can't take everything that's uh, spoken of in a apocalyptic uh, sense as literal. You, you almost have to get a kind of a broad picture of what it's been spoken of and what it would mean in the minds of the uh, readers at that time, and then you get a sense of what they're really trying to convey, and that's the case here. So we'll try to, to give that sense if we can. But uh, in the first part of Zechariah, there's a series of visions. There's eight visions. And then uh, we get in the non-vision area of it where God is just speaking directly to the uh, prophet. So this uh, chapter 6 is the eighth vision. And he says, then I... Uh, Turned and I think uh, last time I started here, but I, when we read the uh, sixth chapter of Re Revelation to kind of give an idea of what these horses may have meant, and there's been a lot of uh, writing about what they really meant. So you can read the, that Revelation chapter six and form your own conclusions about the matter. But he said, I turned and raised my eyes and looked. And behold, behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. So this is a mountains are always portrayed as something very uh, significant, very monumental, uh, long-lasting. So when they come between two mountains, that gives them a sense of uh, endurance or uh, durability, if you will. With the first chariot were red horses. Um, let's see, I've got something. Uh, 
Then there were second chariots. Now, chariots are usually uh, associated with war, but not always, and here is probably not associated necessarily with war. But third chariot, but it, it does have to do with strength, though. If the uh, third chariot, white horses. Fourth chariot, uh, dappled horses. Uh, strong steeds. The fourth, the fourth chariot were the ones described as strong steeds. Now, I guess you could say that all of them are uh, described as strong steeds, but the juxtaposition with the dappled horses kind of suggests that they, they were the strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked to me, he said, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, these are four spirits. And if you go back to the Hebrew, it could mean winds. Uh, four spirits of heaven who go out from their station uh, before, before the Lord of all the earth. So they have a, a station somewhere stable or whatever it is and they're going out and so they are going out as God's messengers the one with the black horse uh, horses is going to the north country of course that would be Babylon and Syria and, and up in there and, and the dappled uh, the white are going after them they're, they're following the the black horses, so there's, you know, black horses have got some backup. It's going to be a, they're going to have that covered. And the dappled are going toward the south country. Now, the red horse is not mentioned anymore, and it's not known why they're not mentioned, but they're not mentioned anymore. And then the strong steeds, of course, in the New King James, it's, it's plural. And as it was in three, so it may be the dappled horses, which is more than one. Those are the strong steeds. Uh, went out, and they were they were eager to go. You know how a horse gets ready to go, and it he wants to go. That they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, "Go," talking to the horses, "Go walk and to and fro throughout the earth." So they walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they're examining things. They were uh, their messengers. They're going out checking on things. In verse eight, he, and he called to me and spoke to me, saying, "See, those who go towards the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country." You know, uh, because of the uh, evil nature of the people of the north, Assyria and Babylon and what have you. Uh, the way they persecuted Jerusalem, that uh, kind of troubled the Lord, and he took action. But now his, uh, they went and checked on it. Now his spirit is uh, rest. He gave rest to his spirit in the north country. So things were taken care of there. And indeed they were. <laughs> then... In verse 9, uh, the word of the Lord, and uh, you need to keep uh, this, the word of the Lord, it, it, it mentions that a number of times, and that gives the idea now that there's authority, this is the authority for what's being said. And this is, of course, that ended the visions. This is not uh, one of the visions. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Receive the gifts from the captives. These were those that came back from uh, Babylon, from uh, Helda, Tobijah, Jedediah. They have come from Babylon. And go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, and take the silver and gold, and they brought silver and gold back make an elaborate crown and if it's the King James or ASV may say crowns more than one it is actually plural in the, in the Hebrew make an elaborate crown and set it on the head of Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest uh, well the high priest 
didn't wear crowns. They were, uh, we would call them turbans, if you will. But here, he's saying, set this crown, and it's a elaborate crown, maybe a multi, uh, if, it's, if it's plural, maybe the way it's constructed, and set it the head of uh, Joshua. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. And here's a, 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 obviously a messianic uh, passage. And we, we saw this before over in chapter 3, verses 8. And it's a more elaborate uh, and extensive uh, presentation here. But he says... Behold, the branch whose name is uh, the man whose name is the branch. And there's <clears throat> five things that is said about this, about what the branch will do. From his uh, number one is from his place he shall branch out. Uh, number two he shall build the temple of the Lord. Number three, he shall bear the glory and sit and rule on his throne. Number four, he shall be a priest on his throne. And five, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So it's uh, obviously that he's talking about Christ, and here's uh, what uh, has been written about these five things. The first one you know, that I mentioned, he shall grow up... Uh, uh, out of his place, he shall branch out. He would uh, grow up as a root out of dry ground in the midst of a corrupt age. And we, if you can go back to Isaiah, the, the uh, 53rd chapter, you know that's uh, the messianic chapter. Isaiah, the fifth, 53rd chapter, verse 2. For the house of David uh, would be a tent that's uh, fallen into decay. Amos 9:11, and he would grow up from among his own people in his own land, and, and from a lowly origin and a state of rejection, he would be exalted and lifted up and and uh, be very high. And that's the 13th verse of uh, Isaiah 52. So obviously he's talking about about a Christ. The second thing that he uh, mentioned, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Uh, yes, he shall build the temple of uh, of the Lord. Said it twice uh, the hands of Zerubbabel as we know had laid the foundation of the, the material temple and his hands would complete it it was uh, prophesied that he would complete it and he did but the branch would build the spiritual temple so we need to keep in mind that a lot of times when talking about uh, uh, the temple or Jerusalem or Zion, uh, they, there are physical uh, entities so, as such, but a lot of times what's been talked about is the spiritual. And here it's talking about the spiritual. The temple that's being talked about here, the spiritual temple, is the church. And uh, it's made of living stones. First Peter 2 verse 5 it's a holy temple of course it's a habitation of God in the spirit in Ephesians second chapter verses 21 and, and following and we now are that house Hebrews the third chapter verse 6 now the fact that he said it twice is a uh, emphasizes that the uh, promise is, is sure is going to take place. Third thing he mentioned, he shall bear the glory and sit and rule on his throne. Now, of course, he's uh, you know he's going to bear the glory. He's going to be uh, laden with honor. The branch is going to be laden with honor and majesty and power. And of course, that describes Christ. <clears throat> and it's uh, this preeminence. Uh, he is preeminent. His greatness is preeminent, and 
it uh, alludes to his kingship also because he's going to sit and, and rule on his throne. The throne that was promised him, this branch, uh, was the throne of David. And we can find that in a number of different places, Second Samuel, Isaiah, and so forth. And that was the throne of God. And David's throne of rule has been the throne of God also. You can find that in 1 Kings 2.12 and 1 Chronicles 29.23. <clears throat> The fourth item, and he shall be a, a priest on his throne. In the throne of the, uh, the branch, talking about Christ, the throne of the branch, uh, the, the offices of king and priest are combined. And we see in the historical Melchizedek, uh, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, Jerusalem. But he was also a priest of God, uh, most high of Genesis. You can go back to Genesis 14, chapter verse 18. It gives you that. Through David, God had sworn that uh, the king of his appointment would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalms, the 110th Psalm, verse 4. The man, and the man whose name is the branch, God now declares that this oath will be fulfilled. In the New Covenant, the New Testament, uh, this is uh, more than abundantly confirmed. He was raised to sit on David's throne, Acts verses 29 through 31 he sat down at the, talking about Jesus of course he sat down at the right hand of God Hebrews first chapter verse 3 and he was there he was to sit until all his enemies are made his uh, footstool that's the 13th verse of Hebrews chapter 1 and this is to be accomplished when the last enemy Death is abolished, put under his feet. First Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter, verses twenty-five through twenty-six. And of course, this is going to take place at the final judgment. Further, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse nine, and the first part of the chapter seven. And he's making intercession for all who come to God uh, by or through him. Hebrews 7, chapter verse 25. So he's serving as the great king priest on the throne of God. Revelation 3rd chapter verse 21. He is coming, but he's coming to judge and deliver the kingdom up to God the Father that he may be uh, all in all. First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 24 through 28. And the fifth thing that's uh, mentioned in the Council of Peace shall be between them both. That means that peace will be provided by the branch holding the twofold office of uh, king and priest. His concern will be to provide peace for his people as had been foretold by earlier prophets in Isaiah and Micah and preached by the apostles who came after Ephesians the second chapter verse 14 and verse 17 and he provides this uh, the council of peace by his ability to reconcile men to God by ruling in their hearts. So this is the uh, the branch, clearly messianic. Now in verse 14, uh, we continue on there. Now the elaborate crown shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord for uh, Helam, and that's uh, 
Helda, why the name changed, I don't know, Tobijah, uh, Jedediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. Now, there's some question about is this a proper name or something else? Uh, it could be uh, Hen could mean grace or favor or something like that. So it could mean the favor of the son of Zephaniah or grace. It may not it may not actually be a fourth person, but you can look at the Hebrew of that and make your own determination. Verse 15, even those who are far away shall uh, come and build the temple of the Lord. Now, those that are far away, of course, you're talking about uh, Gentiles. And, of course, Jews had come far away too, so it may be a combination of the two, but certainly. But Gentiles didn't help build the temple, the physical temple. So this has to be an allusion to building the spiritual temple. And the way they build it is become members of that temple. So we're talking about the church. They're going to build the uh, temple of the Lord then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. These things are always conditioned on obedience. Now, the temple is going to be established. Uh, it's going to happen. But if you want to be part of it, you're going to have to be obedient. This has always been the case from the very first of creation obedience is required and you must not only obey the voice must diligently and that's that has a, a lot to do with the attitude of one in, in rendering obedience to the Lord now beginning verse 7 now in the fourth year of King Darius it came to pass that the word of the Lord and keep in mind that the word of the Lord appears a bunch of times. So we'll be uh, mentioning that again. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislef. Chis or if you have King James, it's Chislu. Just a difference of spelling. And yeah, when the people, I'm having a hard time reading here, when the people, and uh, I think the King James says the same thing, when the people sent uh, Sherezer, but the ASV says when the uh, people of Bethel, and, you know, that uh, was a city given over to idolatry, and uh, so this people who had been given over to idolatry sent Sherezer with uh, Regum Melech with his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and asked the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets saying should I weep in the fifth month as, and fast as I have done for so many years now there were a a number of uh, feasts that these people were keeping when they were in, in captivity. But the key, feasts they kept were not the ones that were authorized by uh, Jehovah. And uh, the feasts they did keep had to do with something with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. And we'll get into that later. But the only feast day was the... Uh, Day of Atonement. And they didn't keep that. Not in captivity. So. They had kept it all these 70 years. While they were in captivity. These feasts that. That uh, God had not. Authorized them to keep. But they were keeping it. And it had to do with the destruction of. Jerusalem. Destruction of the temple. You know things like that. And they want to know. If they should continue to uh, keep these feast in verse 4 then the word of the Lord 
There's that phrase again, the word of the Lord, so that uh, gives the uh, thing that is being said authority. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, that's the prophet, saying, Say to the people of the land and to the priest, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, they were actually four or uh, five of those feasts that they kept, during the 70 years, did you really feast or fast for me? When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, uh, did you really fast for me? I think I may have been saying feast when I meant fast, but uh, there's only one fast that was authorized, and that was the uh, Day of Atonement. Now, it's a good question for for God to ask them, because they were keeping fee, uh, fasts that were not uh, authorized. Now, that doesn't mean that one couldn't fast if they wanted to. Now, that wasn't the point. But why were they keeping these fasts? And it had to do with something about uh, the siege and, and destruction of the uh, temple, the, the, the uh, breach of the walls, and, and so forth. It had something to do with that. Well, why did that happen? That happened because of their disobedience. So the Lord is asking them, are you fasting because... I punished you for your disobedience. So if you're fasting for that, are you really doing it for me? Or are you just uh, lamenting the fact that these things were taken away from you? The punishment was divine. You deserved it. So why are you fasting uh, about things that were a result of your disobedience? Now, he's not saying you can't fast. Uh... But he said you're keeping it as a as a religious fast. So you're not, but you're not doing it for me. You're doing it because you lost these things. When you eat and when you drink, in verse six here, when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? They're doing it for themselves. They're doing it because of uh, their pining for the days that were the days that were past because of their disobedience. Should you not have, in verse 7, should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowland were inhabited? Before you were invaded by uh, Babylon, of course, Israel uh, invaded by Syria, shouldn't you have obeyed me then? Well, this wouldn't, wouldn't have happened if you had been obedient to me. And there would be no occasion for these fasts. Well, they didn't. Here in verse 8, it said, Then the word of the Lord, we have that phrase again, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy, and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. So these are very uh, noteworthy uh, prescriptions for obedience to the Lord. But, you know, in going over with the other prophets, we know that they didn't do this. They did the exact opposite, and that's the reason that they were, they were destroyed. Verse 11, it says here, But they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, and stopped their ears so they could not hear. And of course, this is a euphemism that they stopped their ears. They didn't put their fingers in the ears. They just... They heard the things, but they didn't uh, actually uh, obey it. Is some reason that got flaming up here? Is the screen on there? It's on here, so. <laughs> okay, it's off here. <laughs> I, 
I didn't know what it meant. He said, Philemon 1, check your watch. <laughs> so, I know it's in there somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, stopped their ears up, because they didn't want to hear what uh, was being said. And yes, they made their hearts like flint. Now, if it's a uh, King James, may say adamant stone, or ASV says adamant stone. And adamant stone is not necessarily flint. It could be. It could be something. It's a it's a hard stone, like diamond or something like that. It's a very hard stone. Of course, flint's pretty hard. So they make their heart, let's just say they make their, their hearts like uh, like a very hard stone, couldn't be penetrated, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. And so that uh, gives, uh, if we're to uh, uh, give heed to the uh, Old Testament scriptures, and uh, we are, then we should listen to the prophets also. And that's, that's uh, of course, been the whole purpose of this study is to listen to the prophets and see what they had to say to us and not make the same mistakes that were made by the uh, auditors of old. He sent his spirit uh, by the former prophets. This great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. They didn't listen to the prophets, so they were punished. Here in verse 13, we see the inevitable result of their disobedience. Therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed, and they would not hear, so they called out, and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. God is always making appeals to us uh, to be obedient. But there comes a time when we continually and adamantly refuse to heed his uh, uh, supplication to us to repent there's going to come a time when we're going to be we're going to be in dire trouble and we're going to plead to the Lord for help but he's not going to listen because we've demonstrated that we don't want to we don't want to hear what he has to say he said the uh, so they called out, and I would not listen, says the Lord. In verse 14, But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land uh, desolate. Now, that did happen when they were taken off in captivity. There were very few people in the land. So the question is answered why fast uh, well you don't have to fast you just know to need to do the will of the Lord whatever that is and then you won't have an occasion to fast we'll uh, take up chapter 8 next Wednesday thank you <laughs>